Hello, pup parents, and welcome to today's episode of the Perfect Pup Podcast. My name is Devin. I'm very excited for today's episode. I was just chatting before we started with Kim and was getting extremely excited about what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be diving into potentially the pitfalls of thinking of our dogs as pets and looking at the welfare of our dogs as a whole and really just kind of diving into a topic that I don't know much about. So I'm very, very excited to have Kim Brophy on with us. Thank you, Kim, for joining on the podcast. Yeah, Devin, I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Of course. And and like I said, we're going to dive into you know, topics that we really haven't covered on this on this podcast. So it's going to be a good one. But before we do that, I just want to introduce Kim um, and just kind of go over some of the who who she is. So, you know, who you're you're learning from. So Kim Brophy is an applied ethologist, uh, which I'll have her kind of break down a little bit on, on what that means. Um, she's also a member of the International Society for Applied Ethology. She owns the awarded Dog Door Behavior Center. She is a certified dog behavior consultant a board member of the Asheville Humane Society. She is a certified professional dog trainer, member of of the Association Association of Professional Dog Trainers. She's been uh, voted APDT Outstanding Trainer of the Year. Um, She is an author of of a book called Meet Your Dog, The Game-Changing Guide to Understanding Your Dog's Behavior, and is a TED Talk presenter, um, which I will link to that as well, because you should definitely, without a doubt, go watch her entire TED Talk, because it is Phenomenal. Anything I missed there, Kim? Anything you want to add or or clarify? No, I don't think so. Okay. So let's start off first with, you know, who you are and why you love dogs and animals. How did you get your start as a dog slash animal enthusiast? Well, it's funny because, you know, if you um, talk to a bunch of ethologists uh, that, that are just regular ethologists, not applied ethologists, and I'll talk about the difference of those things in a minute, but um, ethologists are generally studying animals in their natural habitat, just observing, right, and documenting behaviors. Um, and so as a kid, growing up in the enormous mega city of Atlanta, Georgia, um, oddly enough, I know many of us are too young to remember these times, but in that massive city, just a you know, a few minutes from downtown, the dogs were still loose in my neighborhood. And as a child, I was really intrigued by everything in the natural world. I mean, my parents couldn't get me to read a book that was an assigned reading at school, but yet I was reading all the encyclopedias and National Geographic's I could get my hand on hands on. So I think as a young kid, I just kind of had this um, naturalist, uh, you know, tendency in me. And then um, growing up in the city, though, my opportunity to observe animal behavior was really limited, right? By what whatever species were available in my suburban backyard. Um, And so uh, growing up with dogs, um, they were at my feet and, you know, I had access to them all the time, Um, not just my own dogs, but also the neighborhood's dogs. So in my many wanderings around, you know, um, in the neighborhood and whatnot as a kid, um, I I had the opportunity to observe a lot of dogs just being dogs. And I think that's where I got really hooked and it sowed some seeds for what would become a career later on. I love it. That's super interesting. I I have also been in an I've lived in an area where dogs were just kind of roaming free and it it is it is it's a very interesting experience to see them like you said just kind of living their own life how a dog would live. So mm-hmm. on that note, you know, you said you're an applied ethologist. There's a difference between ethologist and applied ethologist. And, you know, tell me a little bit more about that. And I guess additionally, like, what are you really focusing on and looking at when you are doing the work of an applied ethologist? Yeah, it's a great question. So um, first of all, ethology is just the study of animal behavior in their natural environment and habitats. And so um, from that kind of biological or evolutionary perspective, uh, looking at why animals are the way they are physically, behaviorally, um, in terms of their sensory capabilities and their processing, um, their instincts, et cetera, you know, how they fit like a key and a lock to their environment and, and um, all of the things that surround that in the ecosystem. And then Applied ethologists, um, which again is a field that and we were talking about this before we started, it's really a field that's been um, present in Europe, but really hasn't had a lot of representation at all, much of much at all in the United States. Um, and so uh, applied ethologists are looking at what happens um, for animals that are under some kind of 
uh, direct human control. So captivity, domestication, um, in terms of when, when we do um, meet those crossroads with these animals in captivity or under domestic circumstances, whether it be in zoos, on farms, in laboratories, um, and then in companion homes, when we have control of those environments and then our behavior is interacting with their behavior, kind of everything that can happen from, from, that, um, from that point and all of the challenges, opportunities, et cetera, that arise from our current species kind of um, meeting, as it were, our world colliding with theirs. And what's, what's interesting is that um, the, the emphasis of applied ethology, say, as opposed to something like um, applied behavior analysis or um, uh, applied animal behavior as a, as a discipline, the emphasis is, is more on welfare and, and less on um, behavioral output in the traditional sense of how we're used to modifying behavior for our own interests and goals. Um, and like we were talking about briefly before as well, you know, a lot of us, we, we just were born into a world where dogs equals pets, right? Like dogs are in our mind, as we've been taught by definition, pets. That's why they're here. And um, yet for the 10 to 40,000 years that humans have dog and dogs have been living together and coexisting and working together, um, really just the last 40 years has that become the common normal kind of way of living with dogs, right? And so in, in much of the world, dogs are still free roaming in, in other places. Um, and uh, also in much of the world, dogs are still being used for the things that they were historically used for. So guarding flocks, moving and managing livestock um, for protection, personal protection, territorial protection, for hunting, tracking, um, environment control, et cetera. There's just a variety of things that dogs have done throughout history that frankly we might even know our survival as a species to on some level you know quite arguably from from that anthropology perspective um and so you know in our minds it's like well we bring them into our homes and we do all these nice things for them and and there are pets and there are babies and that's what they're for and they're here to make our lives better and more enriched and fun and for the kids and whatever and we don't think about the fact that um we have uh interrupted kind of a natural relationship of checks and balances between the environment and the organism where they can solve their own problems and make sure that they're handling life circumstances well um and that they have the best opportunity to adapt and survive um it, in meaningful ways, right, that make sense to them and feel good, uh, I think we, we have a hard time digesting the reality that our pet dogs, the average pet dogs, are captive. They're captive because we, we rotate between fences and leashes and crates and houses and the autonomy that any wild animal would enjoy, that we enjoy, um, that street dogs all over the world enjoy, even if they may have, you know, some compromised physical welfare compared to some of our pet dogs, the behavioral welfare, the psychological welfare, the emotional welfare um, is often far greater than what our dogs are experiencing as we've put them uh, as square pegs in round holes in many cases. So we have dogs that we humans developed to be very specific in those behavioral ways I described, but we don't like those behaviors anymore. We don't want them to protect us from our friend coming over. We don't want them hurting the children in the backyard. We don't want the terrier digging up our rose garden. So we aim to train away behaviors that we humans have bred into them for tens or you know, tens, uh, hundreds of years, in some cases, thousands of years. Um, and then we get frustrated when it doesn't work because we keep kind of continuing this mantra of, well, it's all how you raise them, isn't it? Like puppies are just blank slates and they'll be what we want. So we just pick the color and shape and size that we think is cool. Um, and, and there's kind of a whole like reality check that needs to happen culturally for us if we really do want to help our dogs and um, also have an easier time living with them going forward. Wow, that, that's very interesting. And so you're you're saying you know we have for example i'm going to use example of retrievers i have i have labrador retrievers right like for thousands and thousands of years these labrador retrievers and lots of retriever types were bred to retrieve whether it was hunting or whether it was helping with you know bringing in fishing nets or you know x y and z different jobs that they had and now i live in an apartment with my labs and they don't have opportunities to do that and that can what you're saying is cause a kind of negative I guess expense on their mental welfare is is that am I understanding that yeah like, well, I'm kind of oversimplifying it but is that what you're saying 
Yeah. And I love your choice of words there as an expense. I mean, you know, Labradors um, and many of the gun dogs in the gun dog group are more modern breeds than some of the other breeds. And so like, it may be that it doesn't have thousands of years behind the selective breeding, but those hundreds of years behind the selective breeding for basically this highly cooperative partner hunting of, you know, game birds and, um, you know, out in the outdoors. And so like, essentially with a gun dog, it's easier for us to meet some of their needs relative to some of the other breeds, right? Because there's some types of dog where we really have no tolerance for what we bred them to do in our modern world anymore. And so finding acceptable alternatives, like, so what is considered in say zoology enrichment in the environment. So we're providing healthy outlets of expression for behaviors. That's easier for something like a Labrador because we could just be playing fetch, right? Um, you know, there's other ways that we can kind of fill that cup. Um, and also just through like cooperative efforts through cooperative hiking and adventures and things like that, it can hit the nail on the head for them in a way that is like, ah, okay, so like I, I now I feel like I'm, I'm in my zone. I'm doing what I was developed to do. It just feels right. You know, every organism, when they're doing what their niche is, what they were artificially or naturally selected, you know, as the case in most uh, natural species to do, they get dopamine for engaging in the behavior. So it's kind of internally self-reinforcing, like, yes, this is what I'm supposed to do. This feels right. And they experience a lot of frustration when those, what are called modal action patterns or instincts don't have a place to go. And actually there's a lot of documentation in zoo animals on um, what is called zoocosis, which is what happens when an environment does not afford an animal in captivity, the opportunity to express those natural instincts. Um, they start developing stereotypical repetitive OCD behaviors and a lot of like maladaptive dysfunctional expressions. Um, and we see a lot of those behaviors in the pet dog population. But again, your characterization of the expense or the cost of that taps right into what's a cornerstone principle in evolution and ethology, um, which is the economy of behavior or neuroeconomics. And there's a, there's a bunch of different ways you can think about the economy of it, but what's putting a deposit in, what's making a withdrawal, you know, what does the environment afford the individual? That kind of economic language, I think, is a nice concrete way to think about, you know, what we're taking versus what we're giving. And a lot of the times we're taking without realizing how much we're taking and we're not giving because we don't know what needs to be given. So that kind of leads me into my next thought, which is, you know, maybe we pivot away from retrievers and, and talk about one that is, you know, less easy to kind of meet those needs. Let's say uh, like a, like a herding breed, like you said, you know, we, we don't want in, in today's society, we don't want our dog chasing after cars. We don't want our dog chasing after kids that are running by. We don't want them chasing after other animals. So how can we give our dog outlets? And, and I will say too, that there is a, a, a part of this that feels I don't know what the right word is, but maybe like, man, did we, did we corner ourselves into a situation where there may not be a real solution or are there things that can be done to help these dogs meet their, just their basic needs? Like you're saying. You said the difficult part out loud. And so, um, the truth is, is that at the end of the day, having the conversation that needs to be had culturally, right? Because if we just keep punting and like procrastinating having this difficult conversation about the dog population in the face of our modern conditions and how well those things work or not, um, it's just gonna get more complicated and escalate and snowball. But it immediately does beg that question of the gene pool itself, right? Like, why do we keep breeding so many border collies and cattle dogs and Australian shepherds if lots of people think they're cool and really pretty, but at the same time, we don't want 50% or more of the behavior that just typically comes along with that phenotype, with that type of animal. And so, sure, are there ways we can provide healthy outlets? Are there alternatives? Yes. There's things like tri-ball, which is like a big ball that you can, you know, help um, to direct the herding instincts onto um, for herding dogs. Uh, there's a variety of different games that you could create where the dog feels that they're getting some sense of satisfaction of creating order out of chaos. However, given the fact that most of those dogs are bred to work a 12 to 18 hour day on a farm, you know, are we taking this much off of that frustration block, you know, by doing that? Because it's like how much patience and time, frankly, do most pet families have to go work tribal with their dog? 
you know, or to provide any kind of other healthy outlets. The reality is, is people are busier and busier. They don't want a dog that's a full-time job. Something like a herding dog is meant to be a pretty much full-time companion to that shepherd or the farmer. And so, you know, confining them to pet conditions and then doing something maybe for 10, 30 minutes, hey, even an hour a day is just taking a little bit of that edge off for the dog. Um, and so then it does beg the question of if we are putting the square peg in the round hole, how big can we make the round hole to fit the square peg? <laughs> Or do we need to start saying, maybe we need to start making round pegs, right? Like that's one of the arguments that, you know, my um, uh, hero and good friend who's passed a few years ago now, Raymond Coppinger, um, he's been talking about that for decades, that if we expect a dog to behave like a pet, we should be breeding for pet characteristics, not preserving all of these breeds out of our romantic affinity for them. And yes, they're gorgeous and impressive and can do all these really cool things. But unless you're planning on doing like competitive sports or competitive herding or, you know, um, you know tribal or some other kind of appropriate substitute that's going to satisfy those instincts for the particular type of dog you get, we're really going to feel like the frustration for us and for the dog the challenges are going to outweigh the benefits again with that e economical kind of language, like the withdrawals are too high and the deposits aren't enough. Mm. Very interesting. So, uh, you know, I, I think with like a lot of things in life, it can feel. Yeah. Like, like you're saying, we, we may be putting ourselves into a situation where there's not a great way out. I do think like you're saying at a bare minimum, and, and maybe I'll, I'll pose this as a question you know, I'm sure there are people listening right now who have Australian shepherds or who have breeding or they have terriers who like to dig and, and, you know, X, Y, and Z different behavior. What do you recommend for these pup parents? Because, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of, a lot of people listening right now or watching, they are probably in a fresh, a state of frustration. And, and a lot of that can be tied back to, you know, maybe the breed is not fit for what is being given to them. So how can pup parents go about trying to find solutions for this or you know what what do you recommend when you when you bring dogs in and you're working with them what do you recommend to these to these pup parents to help their dogs live a more fulfilled life well the first and most important thing that's really easy to kind of gloss over and move past but is in my experience of working with families and dogs for 20 plus years so critical and sometimes transformative frankly is learning about the type of dog that you have their history and what they were used for. And then changing your perception and your expectations for your dog's behavior based on seeing it through a new lens where you realize that a lot of what they're doing that might be making you mental and making you think that there's something seriously wrong with your dog might just be completely typical for that breed. And yet it might not be on any of the sites that you saw when you were trying to pick your puppy, because remember, there's a conflict of interest there. People are advertising to sell dogs the same way someone might advertise to sell a car. They're not going to tell you all the things about it you're not going to like or that aren't going to work well. They have an investment and therefore a motive in giving you the good side. And basically most of that stuff, I'm not saying all breeders, but most people that are selling dogs are really going to tell you all the high points and tell you that their breed is the perfect family pet, you know, because that's, what's going to bring in the dollars. Um, and so shifting our understanding, understanding and expectations, sometimes often for my clients, it's like, you just took this huge weight off their shoulders. And then instead of judging what the dog is doing, like misbehavior, like we've been told, like it should be solved through more obedience training. They go, oh my gosh, you didn't ask to have that instinct. You didn't ask to feel this way in these conditions. You don't know why you're compelled to chase the children's ankles through the yard. It just happens to the dog as much as it's happening to us and to the kids. And so that moment is as transformative as it would be for any relationship, right? Because then we can say, all right, now I have acceptance rather than just this struggle and this misunderstanding that's just like toxic to that relationship and living together. We can say, all right, I get it. Now what, right? And depending on what that dog was bred to do, that now what might look like, all right, I'm going to just dedicate a section of the backyard yard to the terrier. I'm going to build a dig pit. I'm going to put all sorts of cool stuff in there for him to find. And we're going to have a dig party every day. And you know what? I'm just going to wash his paws every time he comes in. And that's my compromise. That's my deposit in the bank account, right? And so with some breeds, it's easier than others to do that, to find ways to do it. Um, 
but with a lot, there are simple adjustments we can make to how life is unfolding or how they might be experiencing life um, unfolding so that things are at least moving in the right direction, right? We figure out what is malleable and what isn't malleable and we do what we can, frankly, for now. I love that. You know, a, a word that's kind of spinning in my head right now is empathy, right? Like understanding that our, our dogs are unique, not just in the sense of like one dog to another, but their breeds in particular. I think that's such a phenomenal approach to just try and understand truthfully where our dogs are coming from, you know, just like how we would with humans. You know, if we have an interaction with a coworker who, you know, it, it's challenging, you feel like you're always butting heads, you know, sometimes just understanding their history, understanding where they came from, understanding why they maybe have a distrust for certain things in, in a company, right? Like it, it's yeah. all about understanding where they're coming from. I love, love, love that because I think, you know, I think like you said, and, and this is more just my own opinion, I, I do think that there is this kind of curse of, and I hate to just blame it on social media, but there is this kind of curse of, you know, people see these dogs that seem to be perfectly well behaved and they're like, well, that, that dog's doing it. I can do it. But it's like, well, does that dog live in an open area where they can run miles and miles every day? And you're trying to have them in a city, right? Like th there's just so many difference differences and nuances to each breed. I, I really do love that. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and then remembering too, that a lot of the stuff we're seeing on social media is just the snapshot that someone's choosing to show us, right? It's like, you might see a picture of your friend and their family looking like they're happy and they're on the verge of a divorce, right? Because right. people present what they want you to see. And the reality all is that like a lot of the people that are professionals working with dogs have very difficult times living with their own dogs because they're also living in modern pet conditions. So they might show a video that then inspires everyone to, to like strive to that standard only to find out that 90% of that person's day with the dog is a struggle. And then they, they've taught these particular behaviors that just look so tight and clean and tidy and perfect and everything else is a mess. And so there's a lot more of that going on than people realize where professional dog trainers are having tremendous difficulty living with their own dogs. And it's kind of like the secret that a lot of folks hide behind the curtain because they know that they're gonna be judged for their dog's behavior, but their dogs are also in those captive situations. And so, you know, I, I think a couple of things about what you just said, captivity is a big deal. We don't like to look at our dogs as captive, but they are. Mm -hmm. They don't have the choice to go do something else. They don't have the choice to kind of come and go as they please. They don't have the opportunity to just follow their instincts where they're, where they're taking them. Um, all of that is chosen for them through what we provide for them. And if we try to put ourselves in those shoes, it gets clear really quick that that would be pretty unhappy, right? Like I've used this example before and it may seem a little dark, but frankly, I think about The Handmaid's Tale. And like, I think about the fact that like, sure, the women can go to the store with their friend and go get, you know, whatever groceries for the house. Um, they have the freedom to do that, but they're under this kind of mind control and like the threat of like, don't get outside the box, be obedient be nice to your captors, you know, like it, it, the set of expectations isn't as far apart as frankly it should be. Um, but then as you say too, understanding those differences genetically, like historically we've called that in recent decades anyway, kind of like breedism. Like I've literally been called like a breed racist for even talking about the fact that genetics matter when for all intents and purposes, we have different subspecies of dogs, like right. behaviorally, phenotypically, they are incredibly diverse. And yes, most of that variation is the result of changes to their regulatory DNA, not the protein coding DNA. So people think, yeah, but if you look at the protein coding DNA, they're 99.9% .9 the same. That's also true for us and you know chimpanzees. And clearly there's a lot of differences there in our regulatory DNA. Um, and so embracing the fact that the differences matter and rather than like whitewashing or homogenizing all dogs, as it's all how you raise them, embracing the diversity, celebrating what they're bringing to the table um, that humans painstakingly bred into them. If we are going to maintain them, then we need to understand what we created in the first place. So um, my book, unfortunately, right now is sold out, um, but there will be more hard copies in May. There is an audible version, an audio book, as well as an ebook version of Meet Your Dog. And that's a great place for families to start just to understand the particular dog that they have better. 
I love it. And I am certainly going to link to all of those places that the book, your TED talk, your website, all the different places so people can can learn more from you and and with you. Because I think, you know, my big takeaway from this episode is that we we need, I think we all need to learn more about our dogs. Mm -hmm. And we need to learn more beyond how do I get my dog to sit or how do I get my dog to walk nicely on a leash? And we need to look, we need to dig a little bit deeper and be willing to put in the time and effort because, you know, at the end of the day, we did choose, you know, in 99% of, of the cases, individuals listening, you chose to get a dog. You, right. you made that decision to bring a dog into your home, which there are so, so, so many benefits. And obviously I'm an advocate and you are an advocate for dogs. We all love dogs, but there are, when we make that decision, we need to be willing to dig a little bit deeper and, mm -hmm. and better understand our dogs. So I, I've learned so much. I'm certain my listeners have as well. Is there anything else, Kim, that you want to, you know, any advice or tips you want to give to uh, people who may be struggling with their dogs or just feeling overwhelmed or overcome with, with dog behavior right now? I would conclude with um, the thought for people to ponder on that behavior problems rather than being an obedience or lack of training issue are evidence of compromised welfare. That's a lot to swallow. So we've been told that it's, it's an obedience and it's a training issue. And the truth is until we made dogs captive, there wasn't a need for professional dog trainers for your average family dog. Like, think about that. Like the whole reason we have so many dog trainers and need dog trainers in the first place is because they're a fish out of water. Mm. That's a lot to swallow, but it is so important. We're experiencing their dysfunction, their own welfare crisis as behavior problems. And we've been told that training is the solution. So I would leave folks with the thought, be curious as to what that behavior is an expression of underneath that surface and work to get to the bottom of it to really meet your dog where they're at. I love it. It's a great thought. Let's in there because I'm, I'm going to go think about it and I'm sure my listeners are as well. Um, but again, thank you, Kim, for coming on. This has been super insightful. I, you know, I'll, I, like I said, I'll link out for everyone to go learn um, more from Kim uh, if you haven't already, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts. It's extremely helpful uh, for more people to, you know, hear this and to gain this understanding that we all just were able to, to gain. So uh, other than that, we will catch you on the next episode. Mm -hmm.